And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. A lot of people believe that sentence might have been better served at the end of chapter 3, but either way, it's all right. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, remember these guys, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. All right, so the setting here, this story takes place during the early days of Samuel's ministry. We saw that Samuel was born to a woman who had been barren, Hannah, after she prayed to the Lord. God opened her womb and gave her a child who she dedicated to the tabernacle, and his name was Samuel. And Samuel is being raised in this tabernacle by Eli, the high priest, who was becoming an old man at the time, who had two worthless sons. Remember it said that? These men were stealing from the people, they were stealing the the food from the sacrifices, and they were having improper sexual intercourse with the women that came to worship at the temple or the tabernacle as well. So the Lord sent a prophet to denounce Eli and said, the day is going to come where I'm going to take the priesthood from your family and your sons are both going to die on the same day. Well, then you get the story where Samuel is in the tabernacle and he hears the voice of the Lord, that great story, Samuel, Samuel, and speak, Lord, for your servant listens. And what God told him was that same prophecy, which he then confirmed to Eli. And it says at that point, the word of the Lord began to appear to Samuel. He became a prophet in the land of Israel, which had been a rare thing at the time. This is taking place during the era of the judges, when it was a lawless time in the land of Israel. And religion was pretty much whatever you wanted it to be, unfortunately. And Samuel is there as a legitimate prophetic voice to the Lord. But he's not actually going to feature in this story, other than letting us know that he was around during this time. What we see are the primary antagonists of the book of First and Second Samuel, the Philistines. Everybody knows about the Philistines. Everybody knows Goliath, the Philistine. Everybody has heard of them before. But let's talk about who these people are. The Bible actually gives us a little bit of insight into who they were. Uh, they're called in other places the Kaftorim, the people who came from the land of Kaftor. Im, I am in Hebrew, is the plural masculine ending. So the Kaftorim are like the Kaftorites. They came from a place called Kaftor, which we read about in Genesis 10, verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 23 talks about how God brought them from the land of Kaftor. Jeremiah 47 and Amos 9 both also mention mention them as being the Philistines. So what is Kaftor? It's an ancient name, we believe, for the island of Crete, which is in the Mediterranean Sea, or perhaps regions that were associated with that. They are sea peoples. They were a seafaring people that settled in the land of Canaan around the time Israel was coming back from Egypt, and they became the primary antagonists. So their culture was not Semitic, meaning it was not similar to the Jews or the Arabs or the Egyptians. It was much similar to the Greeks and the Romans, because that was where they came from. And you can even see this in their governmental structure, that they don't have a a king that rules over all of the Philistines, you have the kings, plural, of the Philistines. There are five primary city-states that were each led by an individual king, and they kind of were in league with each other, which is exactly how the Greek city-states functioned at this time, that Sparta was its own city, and Athens was its own city, and so on, but in times of trouble, they would band together and they would fight. Well, it's a very similar thing here. They also showed up with iron and bronze weapons that Israel was very had a hard time standing against. And it's going to be a back and forth between them throughout the books of Samuel until they're eventually defeated, but they would last for a long time. The people would still be around. When the Romans took over the land of Judea and the land of Israel, as it's called, they began to refer, it, refer to it as Palestine, which comes from the word Philistine as a way to mock and shame the Jews deliberately by referring it to the land of their ancestral enemies. That's where that name actually comes from. 
Well, we have a battle. This is the, the first major battle we're going to see in Samuel, and it will not be the last. And this battle is going to take place between the two cities of Aphek and Ebenezer. And I've got a map for you here. This would have been northward, not the extreme north of the Promised Land, but northward and to the west, because the Philistines were a coastal people. They were a seafaring culture. And at this first battle at Aphek, they struck down 4,000 Israelites. And the people were perplexed at this because, as you remember from the book of the law, God had promised, I will go with you into battle and no one will be able to stand against you and one man shall put to flight a thousand and all of that. So you see in verse 3, they say, why has the Lord defeated us today? They're correct in identifying that it was the Lord that had caused them to lose this battle. However, their diagnosis was correct, but their prescription was absolutely wrong. You ever get that from a doctor? He's real good at telling you what's wrong with you, but he gives you the wrong medicine for it. Oh, I guess that was the wrong one. This is exactly what they're going to do. Their solution is not to call upon the Lord and ask for his help. It is to bring the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle in Shiloh and bring it with them into battle. And you see in verse 3, they say, let's bring it so that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Now, that could be translated he, meaning that the Lord will save us. But in the, the structure of the sentence, the closest referent is the ark. So they're not saying that God will come save us. They're saying, let's bring the ark and it will save us. It's a superstitious solution. Say, so let's bring the ark of the covenant. And then when we've got the ark of the covenant, man, nobody can stop us. They're treating it like your lucky socks in a baseball game. Like, well, I, obviously I lost. I couldn't find my lucky socks. We didn't have the ark. Silly us. We should have brought the ark with us. But it's really, it's tragic. Now, what is this? We need to talk about what this is. What is the ark of the covenant? To put it very simply, the ark of the covenant was a box. It was a box made out of cedar wood. It was four feet by two feet by two feet, a little less than that, but approximately that big. Made out of cedar wood that was overlaid with gold. And inside of the ark of the covenant was placed the tablets of the Ten Commandments, one jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that had budded when the people challenged his authority. And it is also, by the way, uh, debated, was the rod of Aaron placed before the ark or inside the ark? Because it seems like it might have been a little large and the language can go both ways. Either way, they were associated together and they traveled together. Not only that, it had a lid that was placed on the top that was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. So it's important to know this because there are some Christian poems and songs that are very well-meaning, but they do get this wrong. The mercy seat is not a chair that God sits on. The mercy seat is like we say that the court is the seat of justice, right? It's, a, it's describing this is where mercy resides. It's the lid of the box, which is the Ark of the Covenant. And there were two cherubim, two angels that were carved on it, whose wings were to be outstretched towards one another, that that was where God's presence was supposed to reside. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 25. I'll just read the last two verses to kind of summarize for you. The Lord says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. So there's a copy of the law. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So the Lord says, you will have this ark. You would place it in the Holy of Holies, which was the room of the temple that only the high priest could enter once a year. He said, that's where you're going to put it. And from there, I will speak to you. That's where my presence will reside. So you know what we're talking about now when we say the ark of the covenant. Noah's ark was a vessel that was to carry the people to safety during the flood. Just so, the Ark of the Covenant was a vessel meant to carry the tablets of the testimony among the people. That's what that word Ark means. And it could be carried. It was to be designed with rings on each of the four corners of the box. And there were long poles that were run through the, the ring so that they could be carried. And those were wood poles that were covered with gold also. This is something you need to make sure you have as you visualize this. The poles were to stick out past the veil of the temple, so that it could be picked up without looking at it, because you weren't supposed to look at it. It was supposed to be covered by the veil. Even when the priest went in, he was supposed to light the incense so much that he would not actually be looking upon the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? 
And it was carried by the people during their wilderness wandering. And it was carried into battle once. And that happened at the battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. When the priests were to carry the Ark of the Covenant before the people, blow the trumpets, and the walls came a-tumbling down. You all know the story. But it is important to note also that the Ark of the Covenant would be covered. What they would do when they were to transport it is they would lift it up, they would detach the veil of the temple, walk it forward, and cover the Ark with the veil. Then there was a waterproof covering they put over that. Then there was a blue covering that they put over that so that nobody actually saw it. They just knew that it was being carried. And Joshua did take it to Jericho. However, that is the only time we read of the ark being carried into battle. It was not a talisman. It was not a figurehead. It was something that was religious. It was to be used in the Holy of Holies. It was not a weapon. It was not a lucky charm. You've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, maybe. You've seen Indiana Jones. And if you grew up in a pastor's house like I did, where we knew the Bible pretty well, when they have that scene where they're talking about what the ark is, and he says, the Bible speaks of the ark leveling mountains and laying waste to cities. In my house, we'd be going, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't say that. <laughs> and then he says, the ark, or the army that carries the ark before it is invincible. And they're like, oh, well, we better find this thing, right? By the way, we have no idea where the ark of the covenant is. Don't let anybody tell you we, we know because we don't. And maybe that's for the best, as we're going to see when we read this story. But in that description from that film, which is not theology, you get it, but that, it's interesting to quote that because that's exactly what the children of Israel thought about this thing. It's a weapon. If, if it took Jericho down, it'll take the Philistines down. Bring out the Ark of the Covenant. There was no repentance here. There was no weeping over what the people had done. We've been reading about what religion was like in the land of Israel. We know from the book of Judges what morality was like. There was no thought that if we lost the problems with us, the only thing they could think of is if we lost is because we didn't go about the proper ritual and superstitious ceremony to secure this victory. They didn't think perhaps we ought to repent for the way that we've been allowing idolatry to go on unchecked in the land of Dan, or how we've allowed high places to grow up around the land of Israel, or that nobody's keeping Passover, as we're going to read about later, or the fact that the priests themselves, the ones who are carrying this thing, are those worthless sons of Belial that we read about earlier that have been prophesied and denounced by the Lord himself. The Ark of the Covenant had become an idol in the land of Israel. Isn't that tragic to think about? That the thing that was not supposed to be God, it was supposed to carry some important memories for them and represent the presence of God. You weren't even supposed to look at it. I think part of the reason for that is because God didn't want you venerating it. You were supposed to be worshiping the Lord of the ark. In the same way, this is going to be our lesson for the day. Israel had a false understanding of true religion. And they were going to rely on that to get them through the battle. And it's not going to work. So let me put this in our terms here. We also can develop false understandings of true religion. And then rely on that truth, so-called, to get us through the battles of life. And I'm going to spoil it for you right now. It won't work. And then what happens is we begin to feel as if God has failed us and our faith can fail. Israel was letting their culture dictate who the Lord was. This is what the people did. They carried their idols into battle. When the idol comes into the battle, well, now, you, now you're really cooked because Baal's with us. Because look, we got him right here. He's sitting in his little chair. We're carrying him around. Instead of letting the Lord tell them. And if we let our culture of any kind, whether it's mass culture or pop culture or subculture or church culture, if we let that tell us what is true about God, you're going to miss it. And we can become what I'll call soft idolaters. Now, there are certain groups that are, are egregious in their sins. We would call them cults that have these extra books that you've got to read and these aberrant ideas about God that bear no resemblance to the scriptures or to any Christian tradition. There are many of such groups, and most of them don't have any kind of sway. Those exist, but I'm not so much going to talk about those today. I'm talking about those that are sitting in God's churches or those that are somehow connected or affiliated with them who think they're getting it right and wonder why God keeps failing them. The answer is because they're not believing in the true and living God. They're believing a version that they have invented for themselves. So in order to do this, I want to go through, I have seven, 
because, you know, it's a holy number. I have seven things I want to run through here of some of the most important things that we know and we believe as Christians. We're going to remind ourselves about what the truth is, and I want to confront very quickly some of the bad ideas we can have about these things. For example, the Ark of the Covenant was a good thing, but it was not a weapon or a good luck charm. They needed to be reminded. So let's start real basic. We're going to say, what is, or shall we say, who is God? When we say God, there's a whole lot of baggage that goes along with that. Everybody has their ideas about God. But what is the truth about God? God is the eternal spirit of all power and all wisdom. He is self-existent, meaning nobody made God. He has always been. That's what makes him God. We believe that God is triune. He is one God in three persons. We believe that God is imminent, meaning he is right here with us. We don't believe in some distant, faraway God that spun the world like a top and is just letting it go, and eventually it's going to wind down, and maybe he'll pick it up again. We believe in a God who is available, who is right here. Conversely, we don't believe in a God that is everything, man. Everything is God. God's everywhere, and you know, you, you go down the road and you buy a hot dog. That's God, man. God is, is in that. We don't believe that. Well, I'm just as much God as you are. If by that you mean neither of us is God at all, then yes, you'd be correct. God is also transcendent. He is distinct from us. He is not us, although he is with us. Many people, I'd say the most common view of God today is not even that God doesn't exist. Atheism, believe it or not, is starting to fall by the wayside. There's not that virulent, arrogant, angry atheism that we saw for a couple decades. It's still out there, don't get me wrong. And it doesn't mean that what's replacing it is much better. But what you're seeing is a view of God that doesn't care whether he exists or not. God is the ideal to strive for. And in fact, the ideals that we strive for might as well be God. It doesn't matter if God is real or not. It doesn't matter if he has power or if he exists or if he loves us or not. As long as it gives us something transcendent to look toward. Can that kind of God save anybody? And it's interesting that the people that are trumpeting that idea are saying things like, don't wait for God to save you. And we should stop talking about salvation so much. We really need to be looking to the here and the now, as if that's a new idea. We believe in what the Bible calls the living God. When people we say, do you believe in God? And you'll hear intellectual people say, well, what do you mean by that? Sometimes you just want to shake somebody like that. Like, what do you think I mean? I mean, what everybody means when they say, is God real or not? Yes, he is. I believe that there is a literal existent person that we call God, an eternal spirit of all power and knowledge and wisdom and love. That's what the Bible teaches. Number two, what is the Bible? Speaking of that, what is the Bible? I'll tell you. Glad you asked. The Bible is the authoritative word of God. It does not contain the word of God. It does not become the word of God. It does not reveal the word of God. It is is the word of God. It is living truth written down for us to learn and to imitate. It is inspired, meaning it came from God. It is inerrant, meaning it is without errors. It is infallible, meaning whatever it teaches you about life and truth and God is right. And it has authority over your life and mine. It is not a cultural icon. Everybody wants a piece of the Bible. They either want to take it, step away from it, and kind of look at it and watch it. Isn't this great? Look at this Bible. Isn't it wonderful? And never open it. Or they want to take it apart and put it back together. Guess what? Both of those people are coming from the same wrong place. You are looking at the Bible as an artifact rather than something that is alive and operating here and now. The Bible says the word is living and active. You read this book, but the book reads you too, man. Because it's alive, the author is still alive, and he's still around us, still within us, speaking to us. It is true, and when I say the Bible is true, I'm not being slick with my words. I don't mean there's some truth in there. No, it's true, it's real, it is our authority for life. That is the claim the Bible makes about itself. So if you're going to talk about the Bible and ignore that it makes that claim, then you're, you're just not doing good Bible study, shall we say. It's not a cultural icon. To be venerated is like just kind of waved around, you know, like, this is the book. Don't you know the book? When's the last time you opened the book, friend? 
nor is it something to be taken apart and put back together. Because, you know, it's all full of all sorts of problematic issues. No, no, no. It's authoritative. Number three, who is Jesus? Who is that? We say that word Jesus. We say that name. And some of us hear that name and we, tears come to our eyes. Some of us hear that name and tears come to our eyes because we're angry. Don't talk about that man to me. Who is this? Well, Jesus of Nazareth was a man. He was the son of the living God. He was the son of God and the son of man. 100% deity, 100% humanity combined together to provide 200%. A unique person in all of existence. He died on the cross for the payment of sins. He rose again and he's returning soon to judge the living and the dead. He's not just a man. He's not just some guy that might or might not have lived. What difference does it make? The things that Jesus said, they either mean absolutely nothing or they mean everything. And you cannot just shrug them off because we are living in a world that is saturated with the name of Jesus Christ. You know, if it's somebody that just goes down the road and, you know, some crazy man down the street says he's God, well, I can brush that off. You can't brush off the one that has basically been at there every step of the way as culture and civilization was developed. You can't do that. But nor is he just a symbol of those things. Jesus is just a symbol. We hold up his picture. We hold up his name. We attach it to certain things. And he's just, he reminds us of, of our best selves and who we ought to be. And, you know, I think he very well might have risen from the dead. But does it really matter? Yes. Yes, it does. Paul said, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, shall we say, if he's not who he claimed to be, we're the most pathetic people the world has ever seen. And there are some people that believe exactly that about us. Number four, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, the word gospel means good news. So it's a message. What is the message? It's the good news of the work that Jesus did to provide salvation. That forgiveness of sins and eternal life is available for you. That God, through His grace, through His favor and His gift, is offering those things to you today. If you will believe, if you will place your faith in Him. Shall we say, if you will return to the place of creature and creator relationship that was established and broken at the very beginning. It's not just blessing. That's how a lot of people look at the gospel. And some people, that's the gospel they want to preach about because it's more acceptable to people that don't believe. Are there blessings associated with the gospel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you will never have a better and more blessed life than when you start following Jesus. Joy and peace and provision and power for ministry. All those things. Even miraculous intervention. However, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that we are dead in our sins, but the Lord has come to give us life. That we're headed for hell, but heaven awaits for those who believe. That you are a sinner Doomed for destruction, but God will forgive you. That's the good news. It's not just blessing. Hey, come over here and get healed. Hey, come over here and get money. Hey, come over here and be happy. It's not just liberation where we take the gospel and we bend it out of shape to become some political activist thing that is going to set our people free. It's amazing. People that claim to be liberation theologians really have no time for the things that Jesus actually said. Nor is it just morality. Oh, yeah, I believe in the gospel. I believe we shouldn't lie. I believe you should, you know, tell the truth. And I believe that you shouldn't beat your wife. And, and well, good for you, man. I'm glad you don't think those things. But that's not what this is. You can get that anywhere. The Bible tells you that you should know stuff like that. This is forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. So then that leads us to the question, what is the church? What is the church? Well, it's the community of believers. Everybody that has believed in Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, and been saved and believed in the gospel, that is the church. There's something called the church invisible, meaning everybody who has ever lived is a part of, and has believed is a part of that church with a capital C. But it's also the individual gatherings. This is what we call a church, not the building. We change buildings, but the church stays the same, right? It's okay to call the building the church every once in a while. We all know what you mean. As long as you remember that it's not the building, it's the people. It's the people. That here and everywhere, around the world, people are gathering to worship the Lord, and we're all part of the same church, gathering in the name of Jesus to learn his words and to do them and to cling tightly to him until he returns or until he calls us home. Church, friends, is not a social club. 
And that is what the church becomes in areas where the gospel takes root for a long time so that the people forget the fire that started it in the first place. Everybody goes to church. It's where you see your friends. It's where you make business contacts. If you want to schmooze and get to know people around town, find out what church he goes to and, you know, see if you can't join his Sunday school group or something like that. That's not what the church is for. Nor is it just a place for the kids to get out and be around other people or get a little religion in their life because I don't want them, I don't want them to get too crazy with it, but I also don't want them to be a bunch of, you know, rascals running around causing all kinds of trouble. We're not an activist organization. The church has done activist work in the past, but that's not what we're for. There are some folks, this happened in, in the last several years actually, that left the church deliberately because they cared more about their political opinion than they did the church. And that's not limited to one side of the divide. That this is more important. And I had many conversations with certain people where I said, look, that's not what this is. This is bigger than all of that. Nor is it just a place to come and get your transcendent experience, you know? Or, oh, that's just where I go and I, I, I encounter something bigger than myself. Well, I'm glad you did, but that's not what it's here for. We're not community glue. We're, we're a, the congregation of God's saved people of the believers from all time together to stand firm and go and spread the word. So then that, I mean, number six, what is worship then? What is it that we do when we gather together as a church? It's gathering to praise the Lord. Why do we sing when we come here? Because the Bible tells us to sing, friends. And it tells us, it gets all of our words together saying the same things to our God, calling upon his name, worshiping him, calling for help, celebrating, mourning, lamenting. That's what worship is for. Not only that, it doesn't end when the songs are over. We're worshiping right now. I'm opening up God's word. I'm explaining it to you as best I can. We're learning from it so that we can then imitate it. And after it's over, when you're having conversations, when you pray with each other, when you edify one another, encourage each other, rebuke each other, when you join a group and start helping out and doing something for somebody else, that's worship. It's not a place to come and listen to all your favorite songs, whether they're hymns or the most modern songs that are on the radio. It's not a place to hear speeches you agree with. Get a podcast app if you want that, man. This is a place to hear the word of God spoken. Which brings me to number seven, which is important to talk about because of the guys that were carrying this ark. What's a pastor? What exactly is my job here? And I was thinking about this as I was studying. Well, the word pastor means shepherd. If the Christians are the sheep of the Lord's hand, the pastor's job is to guide the sheep. He's a teacher. He's an authority figure to speak God's word. A pastor is to be no one's mouthpiece, regardless if that's you or somebody you admire or your old pastor from your old church. That's not what a pastor is to be. He is to be God's mouthpiece. He's not there to be a motivational speaker for you. I hope you get motivated sometimes when I preach, but that's not what it's for. Well, this just wasn't very edifying at all. This made me feel bad about myself. Well, maybe you needed to feel bad about yourself. I just want to walk out of church feeling good. Well, then don't sin is what it's the best thing I can tell you there. <laughs> Nor is a pastor just to be a ministry executive. That's what some folks want. And listen, we do a lot of great work. We reach out and we do ministries and we're trying to get the church building expanded and all that. And that's a lot of good administrative work. But if we want to really get down to the nitty gritty here, that's not the job I've been called to do. I've been called to be a minister of the word and the spirit and prayer. Which is why I'll just throw this out there. Many people, when they find out that I'm the pastor, that's how I know I'm still young. They say, so what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh. <laughs> and then usually, well, how old are you, young man? I get that question a lot. And, and I've had folks tell me, well, look, I love that church, but I would never go to a church with a pastor that young. Maybe some of you have heard your friends say that when you've invited them to church. Don't tell me if that happens, by the way. Just <laughs> you, you bear that burden. Don't put it on my shoulders. But you know what is revealed in that? First of all, there's a verse in Timothy where Paul tells Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. But you know what is revealed in that statement? It is an assumption that the pastor's job is to give life advice, which you cannot get until you have grown old. That's not my job. My job is to take this book here and teach you what God has to say. And I don't have to have been married for 40 years to tell you to submit to your husband and love your wife. Well, you don't know anything about it. He does. I don't want to teach you my opinions. And if I do give my opinion, which I will from time to time, I'll try to tell you. Here's what I think, but here's what the Bible says. 
I don't know if I could go to a church with a pastor that young or that old or of that race or from that country or it is this and that. You're thinking of these things in carnal terms because everything just ran through from one through seven, there are right answers to these questions. And if you have wrong answers to these questions, you're going to start to act in faith in something that is not promised to you from the scripture. Just as with the Ark of the Covenant, you're setting yourself up for failure. Can I say, I believe, not everybody, but many people who have left the church and never want to go back are doing so because they are reacting to a false understanding they had of something the Bible teaches. Now, some people hear the truth and they don't want to hear it. I think a lot more people don't get the truth and they don't like it. And I hear why they left the church. I'm like, well, shoot, I don't like that either. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stick around for that. Well, that's why I hate God. Well, hold on. What did God say? Because God said what that happened to you was wrong. We've got to stand on what is true, friends. Well, let's get to verse 5 and let's see what happens. It's not going to go well, I'll just tell you. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Hebrews, by the way, at this time in history, is a derogatory term. And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A god has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? It's interesting to think they believed that the Israelites were polytheists. Some testimony they had. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. The ark arrived, and the people gave an earth-shaking shout. They were ready, man. They were, let's go. It's time to fight, because the ark is here. But you know what? The Philistines were just as inspired by that, although inspired by fear, not by courage. And in one of the most catastrophic tragedies of the Old Testament, the battle was lost. 30,000 men died. The sons of the priest were killed, and the ark of God was captured by the Philistines. How could they have lost? The host of the presence of God was with them. Well, the host might have been, but you know what wasn't with them? The actual presence of God. God's ark was there. He was not. And that makes all the difference because the ark was not a good luck charm. It was not an idol. Without the living God, it was just a box. Jeremiah 2.13, the prophet will write centuries after this. He will say, my people have committed two evils. Forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He says, you left the well that had water and you dug a new one with all kinds of cracks in it so it can't hold water. You left the thing that could actually help you so that you could build something that couldn't help you at all. You left the living God to serve the superstition which can't defeat anybody. Israel had faith in this moment, do you see? They had incredible, earth-shaking faith. They were ready to roll. They ran into battle confident of victory. But faith is only as strong as its object. Maybe you've had faith in a chair or a hammock, believing it will hold you. And you had true faith that the Lord would do that, and it turned out, I guess they didn't have enough faith. No, you put your faith in something that couldn't hold you, couldn't sustain you. And God is the one who defines what the object of faith ought to be. You don't hear this phrase as much anymore, but you used to hear it quite a bit. It would say, well, what makes you think you're so good? Muslims have faith. And Hindus have faith. Everybody has faith. Okay, fine. What's your faith in? That's what makes the difference. And implicit in that statement is, it's all made up, so who cares? Well, I don't believe that. Neither do Hindus or Muslims, by the way. Likewise for you and me, faith in a false god is only going to lead to failure. I promise you now. If you heard me explain what all those things were, and you're sitting there, debating in your head. I don't know if you have to believe that. I don't know if that's really what the Bible, I don't, well, guess what? If you try to build on that foundation, it's going to collapse beneath you. If you say, I just believe God is there to make sure that I'm happy. Okay, well, what are you going to believe when a day comes and you're not happy? 
Well, I just believe the Bible, it's, it's nostalgic culturally, but it's just poetry. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. Well, then don't cling to any of its promises. That means it's no more authoritative or no more powerful for you than your favorite TV show. If Jesus was just our best example, who does that help? Because you can't live like that. If the gospel is nothing but a promise of prosperity, then what are you going to believe when you are broke and poor? I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're either going to hate God or you're going to hate yourself. Oh, the church is just there to solve all my problems. Well, what happens when you're in the wrong and the church tries to correct you? You'll have no more time for the church. I've seen it time and again. Well, then I'm leaving. Makes me wonder why folks stayed so long in the first place. If worship is just there to preserve our culture, what happens when culture changes? People will abandon the church. They're leaving God. No, no, no. They're leaving the culture that you're trying to preserve. That's not the same thing. And if the pastor is just another talking head, then why come in the first place? When we put out those fake, lesser depictions of what religion is, we shouldn't be surprised when people abandon them. And the restoration that people are trying to bring about in our day in the church cannot just be, go back to church because that's what Americans do. It's come back to church because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again for the forgiveness of sins and stands in rule and authority over every land, not just ours, but everywhere. Jesus told the woman at the well, she was a Samaritan and she was ready to fight with Jesus. Every version I've seen of her always makes her very sympathetic, and she certainly is, but she also had a lot more spunk than we tend to give her credit for. He's like, hey, can you give me a drink of water? Who do you think you are, Jewish boy, talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. You think you're, I know, you probably think you're better than us. Immediately, she just runs right to the fight, right? You ever, like, order food from somebody like that, maybe? It's like, like hey, I'd like to order a large fry and a medium Coke. Well, what is that supposed to mean? That's what she was like. Fighting over Jesus. Of, do we worship here? Do we worship there? Well, you don't even talk to us. Well, I'm talking to you now. Yeah, but you know what your people are like. And then Jesus says in verse 23, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Spirit meaning it's not just the stuff, it's not just the table or the songs or the pews or the stained glass or the LED wall. It's spirit. And truth meaning you can't make up your own way of doing this, guys, because your enemies are real. The Philistines are out there. And if you don't have the real God on your side, you're going to fall. Your faith needs to be in what's true. And maybe you're here today and your faith has collapsed because you placed it in a version of God that is not the reality. Verse 12, a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head, signs of mourning. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli, the priest, heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? And the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, not even his sons, you notice, the ark of God. Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken and he died, for the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. So we're eastward now in Shiloh, where they had brought the ark from. The battle would have been almost directly westward of that. So this Benjaminite flees. Interesting, Benjamin is the tribe that Saul is going to come from, so perhaps this is foreshadowing, or maybe that's just how it happened. But Eli is waiting for the news. And when he hears that the ark of God has been captured, he fainted and fell to his death. You see how he's waiting and he's trembling for the ark of God. I get the feeling from this that Eli knew this was a bad idea. Remember what I said about Eli? He himself was not such a bad guy, but he was weak. And as I said, he was bumbling. He didn't know how to say no to his kids. So when they said, we're going to take the ark to battle, he knew better than that. He could have said, no, that, that's foolish. We need to repent and tear our clothes and rend our hearts and not our garments. And he didn't do that. He had judged Israel for 40 years. 
And this ended by the fulfillment of the prophecy we read in chapter 2, verse 34, that is Eli's house would be, had the priesthood taken from it when Hophni and Phinehas would die on the same day. And so he falls over. He's a heavy man. Remember, he had gotten fat over the food that they were stealing from the people in the tabernacle. Although he didn't do it himself, he certainly benefited from it. And the people panicked because their faith had been in the ark and the ark had failed. So now what are they supposed to believe? Crises of faith come when we trust in things that let us down. When you believe with all your heart it's going to happen and then it doesn't happen. What am I supposed to believe? Your whole world can be rocked when that happens. We begin to question everything. When the false truth fails, we start to question the legitimate truth. That's how Satan does it. Satan convinces you that God is really like this and the Bible is really like that. So you put your faith in something God never said. Then when it collapses, he comes in and convinces you that the truth is also wrong. And now he's got your soul. He convinces you that way. Many people are angry at God. Or they say things like, I tried Christianity and it didn't work for me. And you hear them talk and it's like, you never encountered the truth. You never encountered what God actually talks about. You had an abusive pastor. You had aberrant doctrine. Maybe you weren't even taught doctrine. You just kind of assumed things along the way. You kind of mixed it with what you picked up online and what your mom used to say and your favorite books and movies and a couple quotes thrown in there. And then a dash of whatever religion you picked up. And you have this weird concoction that can't save anybody. And for some reason, when that happens, we don't think that everything else was wrong. We always direct our attention to the scripture or to Jesus and say, he let me down. The Lord warns us against this kind of thing. Jeremiah 23, verses 16 through 18. The Lord says to people, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word or has paid attention to his word and listened? The Lord is warning the people through Jeremiah, you've got all these false prophets. They'll never tell you when you're wrong. And Babylon's on its way, and they're convincing you it's all going to be fine when what you need to be doing is falling on your knees and repenting. I insist upon the truth of God up here because the blessings of God depend upon the conditions he gave. I can't just talk about the blessings. I've got to talk about what the blessings are grounded in. I will do this, the Lord says, when you do this. If you're not abiding in Christ, you're not going to bear much fruit. If you're sowing to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. That's what happens. Before you blame God, friend, you've got to examine yourself. I love telling this story, as tragic as it was. It was kind of funny at the time, but a guy I used to work with informed me that he had tried every religion. And I was like, no, you didn't. And then he went off and gave a rather long list of churches and religions and cults and denominations he'd tried. And he's like, yeah, I tried it all, and you know, it's, none of it's anything. It's not, none of it's any good. And then I said, well, you didn't try Jesus. You didn't try Christianity. I was, yes, I did. Didn't I tell you? I said, yeah, you told me you went to that Baptist church for a while. You also told me you were sleeping with everybody and dealing drugs in the choir. So whatever you were doing, you weren't trying Christianity. And he goes, okay, all right, that's fair. I'm like, yeah, that's fair. You're, you're basing your whole renunciation of religion over something that has, bears no resemblance to what the Bible talks about. Well, God didn't help me. Yeah, because you weren't walking with God. When a crisis of faith like this comes, it's an opportunity to shore up legitimate faith. Not just to say what failed, but to say, was I wrong? Sometimes it's easier to say God failed than to say I was wrong. When in reality, that's probably the first thing we ought to think. Look to yourself first. Take some accountability. But if you fail to learn that lesson, you might learn it too late. If you're here and saying, I just think that it, we all have our opinions, we all have our choices, and as long as you know you're doing your best, then God's going to accept you. Really? Because that's not what Jesus said. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. God's promises and blessings are real, but friends, so is his revelation of himself and his commandments. You can't skip one. You can't create a God in your own image. That's idolatry. And the promises and the blessings like the Ark of the Covenant will be useless to you if you don't serve the Lord that brought them to you in the first place. We'll finish the chapter, verse 19. Now his daughter-in-law, that's Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, poor lady, I must say, the wife of Phinehas was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the Ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, do not be afraid for you have born a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichavod, Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. But Phineas' wife gives birth prematurely upon hearing the news and she names her son Ichabod, which as I pronounce is Ichavod, And chavod is the word for weight or glory. Those words are very closely related. And by having that e at the beginning, usually it's actually a question. You're saying, where is the glory? So no glory. It's all gone. Is there any glory left in this place? There's actually a play on word by the fact when it says that Eli was heavy and fell and broke his neck. It's the same word, chavod. That means the glory has departed. That there was the, this, this negative, false, gluttonous glory of Israel was end up, what ended up crushing it in the end. And then we know from Jeremiah chapter 7 that Shiloh would be destroyed by the Philistines at this time. It doesn't narrate it in 1 Samuel, but that is what's going to happen. They're going to march on Shiloh and sack the city because the next time we see the tabernacle, it's going to be at Nob. So that means at this time, not only are the people panicking, they're dismantling and preparing the tabernacle to be taken somewhere else so it won't be stolen and there's no Ark of the Covenant. The despair that sets in when your false faith fails can haunt you for life. Some of y'all are still nursing wounds that happened when you were a kid because somebody who claimed to represent God did something to you that is not what God had said or taught you a view of Jesus that is not who he is. Can I just tell you as we come to a close, that's not God's will for you. God doesn't desire you to walk around in despair thinking that the glory is gone from your life. I know some people that are the most angry, loudest atheists that want nothing to do with God. Deep down in their heart, they are desperate for a touch from the Lord. This has been said many times to many different people. Atheists don't believe in God, and they hate Him for not existing. There are many people that's exactly how they feel about the Lord. And there's all a number of reasons. I, I could run through many more, but that's just one example. Because we know deep in our heart that there is something there. There's something that I'm desperate for, I'm hungry for. I've heard people recently unironically describe themselves as having a a hole in their heart. Don't you know that that's what Christians have been saying for years? You've got a God-shaped hole in your heart, and only He can fill it. When I was a kid, you remember the donut man? Life without God's love is like a donut because there's a hole in the middle of your heart. And now I hear, I'm talking seriously, like video game streamers and politicians and celebrities saying, that, I don't, it's just like, there's a hole in my life, there's a hole in my heart. I just want to be like, it's Jesus, you need Jesus. It's not going to help you. Finding a new thing to get excited about, finding a new hobby, finding a new woman or man, chasing after transsexualism or chasing after homosexuality or adultery is not going to satisfy you. Getting more money, getting more cars, more power, it's not going to satisfy Only Jesus can do that. And the good news is, he wants to do that for you. Because what is the gospel again? It's good news. You don't have to follow a false Lord. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good for whom? Those who love God, meaning as he is. If you say, I love you, but you know, you got to change a few things and then I'll really love you. That's not love. I don't know what you call that, but it's not love. 
Love him as he is and are called according to his purpose. Meaning it's his purpose is not yours. Not loving yourself first, but God first. Not seeking your way, but seeking his way. And that involves submission, bowing the knee. But it's a, it's a kind of submission that sets you free. One more example of this as we, we come to a close. When Israel began to worship the bronze serpent. Remember the bronze serpent? Numbers chapter 21, God sent a plague of snakes among the people. And he had Moses set up a bronze snake that if anybody looked upon it, they would be healed. After a while, they started worshiping that thing as an idol in the temple. So Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18 had it destroyed. How can you destroy? This was an amazing thing that God used. Yeah, but now it's become a stumbling block. You've got to break the old lies and start worshiping God in truth. For example, we're going to talk about or we're going to participate in communion this morning, the bread and the cup. There are those that have completely forgotten what this is supposed to represent and they become obsessed with the objects themselves to the point where they actually save and preserve the bread and bow down and light candles in worship to the bread. The bread. Just as the Ark of the Covenant without the presence of God was just a box, so this, without the memory and the worship of Christ, it's just bread. The ancillary benefits, the blessings of being a Christian will mean something to you, but not until you have found the truth. I'm calling you back to worship God as he has revealed himself. And that is our commitment here, is to open this word and find out what God has said and say, that's what we'll believe. Because there is no salvation in any other. The gospel of Jesus Christ is so good and so wonderful that it must never be sacrificed or modified or replaced for popularity, what everybody else is doing, for politics, whatever stripe you're into, or for your own personal gain. What do I want? Delight in